We'll probably talk about a number of things before the evening is over. We usually do. But in this first segment, I'd like to talk a little about the events of the past few weeks. And now that the orgy of coverage for St. Ronald of Reagan is over with, maybe we could now take a dispassionate look at the so-called legacy of Ronald Reagan without raining on anyone's eulogy. You know, it's very interesting that so much of the TV commentary during those two weeks of wall-to-wall coverage focused on Reagan's sense of humor or his personal acts of kindness, these little things that he did that were unreported at the time where he was very sensitive to somebody's needs. To talk about those things is really a tip-off that the man himself didn't make that much of a difference in the lives of Americans and the course of American history. Because if he had, that's where the focus would have been. If he had done something revolutionary, then that's what everybody would have been talking about. And, of course, there are millions of other Americans who have good senses of humor or who perform personal acts of kindness day after day after day. Neither of those characteristics is a qualification that should be at the top of the list in selecting a president. Such attributes as a sense of humor or personal kindness take on importance only because presidential candidates of the two major parties are so very much alike in their politics and their policies. The only difference between them is their personalities. And so... Everybody looks for personal traits that may distinguish the one individual from another. So that's why we talk about Reagan's personality. Conservatives in print and on the Internet talked, of course, also about his dedication to smaller government and his single-handed whipping of the Soviet Union. TV journalists in general, having no interest in smaller government, were much more interested in talking about the fighting of the Cold War when they talked about his policies in any way whatsoever. In truth, however, most of the discussion of Ronald Reagan was as bogus as Reagan's political career. He really was neither the man he claimed to be, nor was he the man who was celebrated these past few weeks. Now, I have to tell you that even though I have no intention of voting for anyone, I couldn't help but being very sympathetic towards Ronald Reagan when he ran for president in 1976 and uh, 1980. After all, here was a man who was preaching that government is the problem, not the solution. And he was being castigated by the liberal media for his effrontery in saying that we didn't need big government, that we should be getting government off of our backs. He even at one point said that the minimum wage laws ought to be repealed. and He took all that back when somebody jumped on him about it. So actually, I was pleased when he was elected president in 1980, and I wrote about him sympathetically in my investment newsletter during his first few years in office. He was blamed for every conceivable ill that befell society, from the 1982 recession to the sudden nationwide interest in the homeless, formerly known as hobos, to the stock market crash of 1987. Whatever happened was called a wake-up call to get rid of it Reaganomics, to do something about getting big government back, while, of course, nothing was blamed on the Democratic Congress. So, obviously, I was very sympathetic to Reagan and all of these battles with the media and battles with the Democratic Congress and so on. But eventually, however, it became obvious that Ronald Reagan was all talk and no action. If government was the problem, why did he keep signing bills that made government bigger and bigger? Few people may remember that when Ronald Reagan took office, the federal budget was only $678 billion. Now, $678 billion is much, much too money, much, much, much too much money for the federal government. But that was nothing compared to what was to come. During his eight-year tenure in office, the budget grew by 69% on its way to today's $2.3 trillion budget. The average annual increase in government during Reagan's administration was 6.8%. 6.8% every year the government got bigger. Now you compare that with socialist big government Bill Clinton, whose average annual increase was only 3.6%. Reagan promised to balance the budget within his first term. Instead, the annual deficit was only $79 billion when he took office, but it quickly rose to $212 billion. And the Reagan years added $1.9 trillion to the federal debt. Reagan is known as a tax cutter, and the term Reaganomics is meant to be a synonym for dramatic cuts in tax rates. But after pushing through a tax cut to be implemented over three years, during the second year, in 1983, he cooperated in the largest tax increase in American history up to that time. The annual tax load increased by 65% during his time in office. Now, I realize that conservatives love to blame all of this on the Democratic Congress. But presidents have the power of veto. And while Reagan did veto some bills, unlike George W. Bush, who hasn't vetoed a single bill yet, in eight years, Congress passed only eight bills over Reagan's veto. And only one of those was a budget bill, having to do with the highway fund. 
I don't remember the exact numbers, but as I recall, the Democratic Congress wanted to pass a highway bill that was something like $105 billion. Reagan said this was obscene. This was big government at its worst, and he submitted an alternative bill that spent only $97 billion. The point is that everything that happened happened with Reagan's approval because Congress wasn't able to override his vetoes more than eight times, and most of those eight bills were minor things that did not have anything to do with these large budget increases. So Congress didn't enlarge government over the president's determined opposition. He allowed it all to happen. You know, pens are cheap. A president can sign thousands of vetoes. And unless his opposition can muster a two-thirds majority in both houses of Congress, nothing can be forced upon him. The determining factor really is whether the president has the will to reduce government. And if he does, no one can stop him. But Ronald Reagan did not have that will. With regard to the size of government, the only somewhat good result of Reagan's tenure was the change in the terms of political argument. Both liberals and conservatives had a vested interest in maintaining the fiction that Reagan was gutting the federal government. Conservatives wanted to point with pride to the reductions in the federal government, while liberals wanted to scream that the sky was falling. Thus, the terms of the debate changed from the question of how much government should grow to how much government could be cut. In reality, of course, there were no overall cuts, but at least the idea of cuts was no longer laughed out of serious conversations. So all of this is in long, uh, it's, it's really in keeping with a long-standing tradition that politics is all talk and no action. You just simply should not believe anything a politician tells you. Well, I've just covered his fiscal policy. Let's take a look at his social policies. The fiscal policies were a sham, but his social promises were all too real. While he said one thing and delivered another with regard to fiscal policy, he said what he wanted in social policy, and he delivered exactly as he promised, or better yet, as he threatened he would. He resurrected the war on drugs, which had declined in activity during the Carter administration. Some of today's worst law enforcement policies were initiated by Reagan's administration and by his prodding. Asset forfeiture began in 1984. Thanks to compassionate Ronald Reagan, tens of thousands of American citizens convicted of no crimes whatsoever have had their homes, cars, and bank accounts confiscated by government. Mandatory minimum sentences were initiated in 1986. Thanks to sensitive Ronald Reagan, tens of thousands of American citizens have received long, long, long prison sentences, sometimes life in prison without hope of parole for nonviolent drug offenses. But wherever he promised more liberty, he failed to deliver. When he ran for president, he promised to end draft registration, which had been revived by Jimmy Carter. But Reagan never even asked Congress to consider such a bill. The one thing he did that really was good was that he ended the price controls on oil and natural gas, and that caused the price of a barrel of oil to drop from around $40 to under $10 because of the sudden renewed production that took place in the United States. But even this was a policy that was initiated by Jimmy Carter, and Reagan merely hurried up the last step in the process by doing it a year earlier than it had been scheduled on the Carter plan. But now let's get to the biggie, the Cold War policy. Reagan's uh, military and Cold War policies seem to be the least controversial. At least they were during the two weeks of homage to Ronald Reagan. It's simply taken for granted that Ronald Reagan ended the Cold War, bringing down the Soviet Union by pushing the Soviets over the edge with increased military spending. The idea is that Reagan initiated a new arms race, one in which the Soviets couldn't keep up with American spending. All right, suppose that's true. So what? Switzerland couldn't keep up either. And neither could New Zealand or Togo or Canada or Brazil. But a nation doesn't collapse simply because its military budget isn't growing as rapidly as that of the United States. The idea of outspending makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Uh, I guess you could say that it's supposed to make us think that the arms race was somehow similar to a drinking contest, one in which one contestant, in trying to keep up with the other one, drinks himself into oblivion. But this wasn't a drinking contest. And when the Soviets couldn't spend any more money on the military, all they had to do was stop, which is what they did. The Soviet leaders wanted, I'm sure, more than anything else to stay in power. And they're not going to spend the national budget into bankruptcy just in order to keep up with Ronald Reagan's spending. It just simply makes no sense. And yet this has been the common wisdom about the end of the Cold War for the last 15 years. Another approach to the Reagan won the Cold War claim showed up in an article that I read just a few days ago in which the writer said that Reagan's tax-cutting program was what brought down the Soviet Union because it revitalized capitalism in America. According to the writer, up to that time, both America and the Soviet Union were in the economic doldrums. But the U.S. tax cuts shot America way ahead of the Soviets, and the Soviet leaders realized they couldn't catch up because they knew that communism was an unworkable economic system. Again, so what? 
Did the Soviet leaders fall on their swords when they saw the Reagan tax cuts creating unprecedented capitalistic growth in the United States? Of course not. Nor did they resign, nor did they renounce communism. They simply continued on their merry way, as leaders in other countries did. Of course, part of the problem with this whole idea of the capitalist revival idea is that national income in America grew by only 3.5% per year during the much vaunted Reagan recovery, whereas the annual average, through good years and bad, was 4.0% from 1943 to 1973. So the average during the Reagan years was less than the average during the 1949 to 1973 period, and yet we're supposed to think that there was unprecedented growth during those Reagan years. Granted, the years from 73 through 80 were pretty anemic, but still, the Reagan recovery, so-called, wasn't in any sense an explosion of great unprecedented economic growth. Now, it may be a long time before there's a definitive theory covering the cause of the Soviet Union's collapse. Certainly, communism is an unworkable system, and it was bound to collapse eventually. It may be something so undramatic as that it simply, in 1991, was the time for it to go ahead and happen, to collapse, with no push from any outside source. But since Republicans happen to be in the presidency from 1981 through 1993, they get to take the credit for that, along with the Lakers winning five NBA titles in the 1980s. If there was a proximate cause for the collapse of the Soviet, Soviet Union, it probably was Mikhail Gorbachev. It pains me to say that because I never expected him to do anything good for the world, either intentionally or inadvertently. Every time a new Soviet leader came to power in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, the liberal journalists in America went to great lengths to tell us how different he was from his brutal predecessors. So with Gorbachev, they happened to turn out to be correct, but they had cried sheep so often that they just couldn't be believed when the time came. Now, it isn't, please understand, that I think that Gorbachev set about to bring down the Soviet empire, but he recognized that it was on its last legs, and he thought he could save it by restructuring the government and the society and by making a more open society that would encourage innovation in the service of saving the state. He also realized that he didn't have the resources anymore to hold the satellite countries in line by force, and so he allowed the leaders in those countries to have greater independence. But things ran away from the Soviets, and Gorbachev got the surprise of his life in 1989. I mentioned that Gorbachev realized in the late 80s that he didn't have the resources to hold the satellite countries in line by force, the satellite countries being Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Albania, and so on. And so he, by necessity, had to allow the leaders in those countries much greater independence to set their own policies. No longer could the Soviets send in tanks to enforce the Soviet way on the satellite countries the way they had in 1956 in Hungary and 1968 in Czechoslovakia. But things got out of hand in May 1989 when Hungarian Prime Minister Miklos Nemeth decided to open the border with Austria. And East German tourists who liked to vacation in Hungary, because it's a beautiful country, the Danube, Budapest, and all that, East German tourists there in Hungary were free to escape into Austria. And the news got back to East Germany, and thousands of East Germans headed into Hungary and on to Austria. Within six months after that, the Berlin Wall was no more. And there was no more Iron Curtain. And the rest is history, and although Ronald Reagan's name may appear in that history, I find it hard to accept the idea that he's the one who made that history happen. With regard to the rest of his foreign policy, I see no spectacular results there. Conservatives like to say that he showed what foreign policy should be by taking a tough line. But the fact of the matter is that whatever he did didn't work out very well. He sent Marines into Beirut, Lebanon in 1983, and a couple of hundred of them got killed by a truck bomb. And in order to deflect attention from that disaster, he then invaded Grenada. And there were two reasons given for the invasion of Grenada, as is usual in any wartime activity. If one reason doesn't work, they immediately switch to another. We've seen that with the Iraq War. One of them was that American medical students attending school in Grenada felt that their lives were in danger there in Grenada because of a communist government coming to power. But in fact, if the United States is going to send in troops and kill people and let American troops be killed every time some Americans have wandered into trouble, then we really do have a rough situation here in the United States. None of us can sleep easy because anytime somebody gets into trouble, we're all called upon to bail them out. The other big reason that they gave for the invasion of Grenada was that they had intelligence from that omniscient CIA that the communists, the Soviet Union, were, was going to build an airstrip there, an airstrip that could send planes to bomb the United States. Well, that sounds good, but you have to realize Grenada is south of Cuba. They already had Cuba. They could have built all the airstrips they wanted in Cuba, and they would be a lot closer to the United States. So what was the danger in an airstrip in Grenada? There really wasn't any. In 1986, after several years of hostility with Libya, of Reagan imposing limits on the 
shoreline boundaries of the Libyan government and so forth. Reagan finally went in claiming that the Libyans were behind some terrorism attacks and bombed Libya, tried to kill Gaddafi, and they actually dropped bombs on his resident. All they did was manage to kill one of his children and, of course, a lot of other innocent bystanders. And conservatives sometimes cite this as the hard line that Reagan took against terrorism, but they neglect to point out that just a few months later, a TWA plane exploded over Lockerbie, Scotland, killing Americans and others in there, and the United States government was absolutely convinced that Libya was behind it. So what good did the bombing of Libya do? No good whatsoever. So Reagan's foreign policy, I don't believe, is anything to be held up as a model. So Ronald Reagan wasn't a hero. I don't suppose he was a brute either. What he was was a politician. And he really was the quintessential politician. A politician, almost by definition, is someone who tells you one thing and does another usually exactly the opposite of what he told you he was going to do. And on that basis, Ronald Reagan ranks right up there at the top with Franklin Delano Roosevelt as one of the most successful politicians ever. Not successful in the sense that he did something good for the United States of America, but that he did something good for his own political career. As to his effect on America, I think he was really one of the worst. Not only did he make government grow and grow and grow, not only did he expand government's reach into our personal lives in all sorts of ways, using the war on drugs as an excuse, but he was also the first president since Dwight Eisenhower to stir any hope in liberty-loving Americans that things might actually be changing. His campaign rhetoric from 1976 to 1980, and in all the speeches he made before that, including the famous speech that put him on the map in 1964 when he campaigned for Barry Goldwater, all of these things made him appear to be what we today would call a libertarian. But if Ronald Reagan, who talked the best game possible, couldn't seem to change anything for the better, that made people feel that no one could. In the process, he did a great deal to demoralize libertarians and small government conservatives, even as he gave conservative party stalwarts something to cheer about. You know, the stalwarts I mean, the conservatives who are more concerned with winning elections for the Republican Party than in bringing liberty back to America. But for those who really genuinely wanted liberty as the first priority, he did do a great deal to demoralize the faithful. Because as I said, the feeling was if Ronald Reagan couldn't do it, then who in the world could? But in fact, Ronald Reagan didn't have the will. I think, and this is pure speculation on my part, but I think like so many people who get into politics, he may have done it because he was genuinely concerned about the the attack, the direction that America was taking. But once in office, he loved being governor of California and then president of the United States, and that became far more important to him than his original mission. This is not unusual. It happens all the time. Sometimes the person sells out because he is genuinely convinced that he has to do so to save the party. And without the party, you're left to the other guys who are going to make America a hell. And so they do whatever is necessary or whatever anyone can, can convince them is necessary for the sake of the party. In other cases, they just like the trappings of being in office, and they'll do anything they can to stay in office. If that means lining up in the homeless chain, as Ronald Reagan and Nancy Reagan did in 1983, where people joined hands all across America and supported the homeless, a ridiculous cause, then Ronald Reagan and Nancy Reagan would do it, even though it was contrary to what he professed, which was that government had nothing to do with this because it had no constitutional responsibility for people's incomes. So be it. All right. Well, let's go out into the real world and see what's going on. Let's begin tonight by talking with Rob in Pittsburgh. Good evening, Rob. Sorry to keep you waiting so long. Oh, no, this has been very, very interesting. Um, but uh, speaking of presidential campaigns, I was I was just kind of disappointed um, a couple weeks ago when uh, maybe it was only one person and maybe you didn't agree with him that much. I wrote you an email about this. I don't know if you saw it, but uh, a fellow named Jonathan called up and he was going on about what a big disappointment it was that Bed Narek had got the Libertarian nomination for 2004. And I just thought, well, this is a shame. I hope there aren't a whole lot of people in the Libertarian Party or movement to feel like Jonathan do, because I think Bednar really deserves our support. Um, I think he's a, a guy with character and integrity, as far as I can tell. And Well, he's a candidate, and if he doesn't start talking in a non-Libertarian way, then obviously uh, Libertarians who are concerned about the political process should support him. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that we should all you know, focus on giving him as much support as possible rather than complaining about that he's not as famous as... Uh, uh, Nolan or Russo or something like that. I mean, we should we should try to help him become as famous as possible between now and November, is the way I see it. Mm -hmm. I understand. And um, also, I want to mention that uh, we had a tax reform seminar here in Pittsburgh last night that I went to, and uh, I was surrounded by a bunch of Republicans, as far as I could tell. And uh, <laughs> but no, I really I really enjoyed the seminar a lot. And it was I know that your philosophy is that the only good tax is a dead tax. And while I admire your ideological purity. <laughs> I have felt, <laughs> what, what's so funny? <laughs> I never thought of it as ideological purity. Right. I just thought of it as common sense, but go ahead. <laughs> well, um, no, I mean, the thing is that they talk about, uh, in the Libertarian Party, for example, the difference between the incrementalists and the uh, absolutists or something mm -hmm. like this. And 
I, I'm, I'm willing to be incremental as long as the increments are big and bold, as long as there's an obvious... And I, you sound that way, too, sometimes. Like, I think you said in maybe in 2000, you said, well, why don't we try repealing one drug law and see if things get better or worse? And when, when people see that things get better, we can then repeal more rather than not. Okay. That wasn't me, Rob. I thought you said something like in one of your articles online about no, legalizing I, I, marijuana or something. Actually, I wouldn't uh, suggest that because I do think that too often incremental things actually make things worse and then create a situation where everybody blames the reduction in government, whatever it was, for what makes it worse. And, you know, last week somebody called, or the week before, I think it was, somebody called in and uh, pointed to what was going on in Switzerland, which seemed to be a step in the right direction with regard to the war on drugs, but actually was replacing one government policy with another. And, oh, that thing with the needles, you mean? Yeah, the needle park. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, no, I agree. That's not incrementalism per se. I mean, that's just replacing one government program with a different one, but no, but they stopped putting people in jail for taking heroin. But, of course, at the same time, they've started having the government distribute the heroin. And while we say, well, that's not what would happen in the United States, that's not what we're talking about, by the time the congressmen get through manipulating and massaging the bill, uh, that may very well be what it is. And then this will be called deregulation, and it will make things worse, just as they called the savings and loan and banking deregulation of the late 1970s the cause of the savings and loan collapse in the 80s, when, in fact, it was something that was part of that deregulation that was a step in the direction of greater government that was just tacked on to it, and that was the rise in the deposit insurance coverage from 20000 up to $100,000, which removed all of the free market restraints on savings and loan managers and created problems for reasons we can go into another time. But the point is that you've got to do things in a big way because only then can you make absolutely sure that you're actually moving in the right direction. And only then do you distinguish yourself from the Republicans and Democrats, and only then are you able to promise a reward that is big enough that you will get people's attention. Pe people are not going to rally to your side when you say, we want a 10% tax decrease instead of a 5% tax decrease. Well, look, I'm not disagreeing with anything you're saying. You're absolutely right. What, what I'm, but that's why I say the, the only increments I'm interested in are huge increments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure, I, I understand. If, I, if you believe, if you're an anarcho-capitalist or whatever, some kind of like real hardcore libertarian, you're not going to get everything you want in one day. So I think that you have to be willing to, yes, don't don't compromise to the point that you don't accomplish anything. But well, the, getting back to what I was saying about tax reform. One, one last point on this, though, is, and that is we're not going to get anything we want right now. What we do want, though, uh, we're not going to get anything in the political process that we want right now. But what we do want is to rally people to our cause. And yeah. we will only be able to do that with bold plans and bold ideas. We're talking with Rob in Pittsburgh. And Dwayne, this up, Rob. Tell us what the thrust of the tax reform meeting was. What were they pushing for? Uh, they were talking about what they call the fair consumption tax. That's okay, to replace the income tax with the sales tax, something that will never happen because in order to equal the amount of revenue being brought in by the income tax, they're going to have to have a sales tax of around 25%, and that will never fly in Congress because you know that once they get serious about the bill, they're going to start exempting the poor and all kinds of favored uh, types of products and so on, products that have political pull, and the rest of us will have to pay 25% then on everything else, and it will never fly. And, what, and, of course, what we want is not to change the way of financing big government but to get rid of big government and only only by pushing for a complete and total end of the income tax and replacing it with nothing do we give people an incentive to want to get rid of big government because they can actually see a reward from it. Uh, I'm going to hurry along here, Rob, because we've got other people waiting. But thanks so much for calling. Always glad to hear from you. Thank you. Let's talk now with Skeeter in Vermont. Good evening, Skeeter. One thing that I want to bring out about the Reagan legacy, uh, something that uh, you pointed out earlier, and that's the fact that conservatives love to trumpet the, uh, this thing about Reagan ending the Cold War, Reagan ending the Cold War. And yet, when it came to award the Nobel Peace Prize for the end of the Cold War, who did the Nobel Prize Committee give the award to? Mikhail Gorbachev, I imagine. Exactly. Uh, but I have, to, I have to tell you, Skeeter, I don't want to rain on that, but the, the Nobel people have given the Peace Prize to some of the craziest people. All you've got to do is to say you're in favor of peace, and it doesn't matter what your actions are. They gave it to Woodrow Wilson, who probably single-handedly caused the deaths of at least an additional million people in World War I by dragging the United States into it. They gave the Nobel Peace Prize to Bishop uh, Desmond Tutu in South Africa, who, as far as I know, has never even been instrumental in breaking up a street fight. I don't put too much stock in what they say. Yeah, but, interestingly but, enough, the Nobel Prize Committee specifically snubbed Reagan, in part because of Iran-Contra and in part because of his invasion of Grenada. Yeah, um, th that's a good point. Uh, certainly he was not peace-loving, and even though the Soviet Union had invaded many countries, at least in the 1980s, they hadn't anyone, at least during Gorbachev's reign. What, what do you think brought down the Soviet Union in the final analysis? Do you have any thoughts about that? Stagnation and corruption. Pure well, simple. Big, big government and corruption go together like ham and eggs. <laughs> yes, all right. I can see you've got good taste in food. <laughs> There's no question about that, and that's one of the problems with big government in America is that it does breed corruption. What is it? P.J. O'Rourke said that when the legislature determines the rules for buying and selling, the first things to be bought and sold will be the legislators. And that's exactly right because they have the power to confer favors and to harm people, and so they're going to be bribed. And whether the bribes are done in a legal or illegal fashion, it doesn't matter. They're bribes anyway. Well, on the other hand, that raises the problem of how do you get rid of big government without creating new Enrons. 
Well, you don't have to do business with Enron, but try not doing business with the government when they come to collect your income tax. All of us can just simply refuse to deal with Enron. And if I'm the only one who decides not to, to deal with Enron and everybody else does, Enron will survive, but Enron still can't harm me. The only people that can harm you are the people with the guns, the people who have the legal ability to throw you in jail or to attach your bank account if you don't go along with them. So big business can get big, big business can get corrupt, but big business will never have the power to harm you the way government can. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Skeeter. Glad to hear from you. Uh, check in with us from time to time. Mark, in New Orleans, I don't want to get you started and then have to cut you off, and we're about to go to the news right now. So, Mark, just hang on, and we'll be back right after the news. Uh, a couple of notes here about Ronald Reagan before we continue. First of all, I'm not picking on Ronald Reagan per se. He's just a politician like everybody else. He may have been personally a very, very nice person. But the whole point of America was that, as Thomas Jefferson said, the politicians were to be bound down by the chains of the Constitution so that we didn't have to worry about whether somebody was a good person or a bad person. We want a libertarian America, not an America in which we rely on the good-heartedness of people not to do us wrong. In a libertarian America, you would pay no income tax whatsoever because government would be so small it wouldn't need an income tax. You would not be roped into Social Security. You wouldn't not be liable to have your assets taken away from you because some next-door neighbor who didn't like your dog barking called the police and said you were dealing drugs or something else of that sort. You wouldn't be thrown in jail as a suspected terrorist and denied the Bill of Rights because obviously the Bill of Rights shouldn't apply to terrorists, even though you aren't really a terrorist. In a libertarian America, your children or you would not fight and die in a foreign war, and nor would terrorists target your city because a libertarian government would mind its own business, keep all of its troops here at home in America, not tell other countries what to do, not arm dictators to help them suppress revolts in their own country in all these ways we would be able to get on with our own lives to keep what we earn to spend it save it give it away as we think best not as people like ronald reagan or bill clinton or george w bush or john Kerry think is best for us or best for the country that's what we want we don't want to have to wonder whether ronald reagan or john Kerry or george bush is a good person or a bad person we want the america that was supposed to be uh, one in which the government fits snugly inside the Constitution. Uh, some emails having to do with Ronald Reagan. Somebody said, where can you get this figure about government growing two-thirds under Ronald Reagan? I will put up a good source for statistical data. I'll put it on the Radio Links page at the next break. Uh, Economic Indicators, a government publication that comes out monthly and is also put up on the Internet, has all sorts of statistics of that kind. Regarding the war on drugs, Kayleen in Massachusetts says when she was called for jury duty, the judge asked if there was anyone among the jurors who might be partial in the trial at hand, and she had to say that, yes, she would never convict anybody of nonviolent drug use, so she was excused. So, of course, obviously, anybody who sits in on a jury trial on a drug case is going to have to first of all, be pre-screened to identify that that person's quite willing to send one up the river just for possessing drugs or in any other way being involved with drugs without hurting anybody. Dave in Minneapolis says, I believe the federal government's definition of terrorism is a non-governmental faction trying to affect social or political change by violence. Reagan went out of his way to fund the Contras, a non-governmental faction that was trying to violently overthrow the democratically elected government of Nicaragua. Wouldn't this have made Reagan a sponsor of terrorism? Yes, and I believe because of that, George Bush is going to bomb the Simi Valley next week. Dave says, when you were discrediting the Nobel Peace Prize, you overlooked that it has been awarded to such paragons of peacemaking as Yasser Arafat and Henry Kissinger. I forgot about that. I was reaching for examples, and I couldn't think of some of the best ones. The other Dave, who's out in Phoenix, says that for decades we were told that communism was a terrible government system. Its method of central control and planned economy were rightly credited with causing the impoverishment and slavery of the people living under it. Then, of course, we're told that Reagan brought down communism by outspending them, by making government bigger and bigger. In other words, he allowed big central government military spending to increase unabated. This obviously makes no sense since on the one hand the same people who criticize communism on the other hand have credited reagan for bringing about its defeat using communism's own methodology and dave's point at the end which is a very good one is as usual the events of history are interpreted in whatever way is necessary to confirm the need for bigger government amen dave in phoenix all right let's talk with mark in new orleans and mark i appreciate your waiting so patiently on the phone Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I guess I'll have to continue the uh, blasphemy. Uh, <laughs> because Ronald Reagan is not considered a saint. He's considered divinity. He's uh, one of those like one of those Roman emperors that have been declared a god. Uh, but he was nothing, and you were too kind, but he was nothing but a malevolent con man. There was nothing decent about him. He, you know, he had no qualms about killing people in other places, and he got involved in other places like Nicaragua, as, as somebody just mentioned. And you may also recall that he got involved in the conflict between uh, Argentina and Great Britain. Oh, that's Britain's right. Side. Yes, of course. Uh, and, and he had absolutely no reason, because supposedly we were allied of both. Uh, but he took sides, and, you know, and, and that cost lives. Uh, and uh, he was basically a con man because of, of 
of all the budgets that he submitted, eight of them, not one was uh, a balanced one. That's not right, one and, one. and not one of them had a decrease in government. Absolutely. He promised to do away with the Departments of Energy and Education, along with his henchmen, and they, uh, they increased enormously. And he instituted a new Department of Veterans Affairs. And the only, the only one that he did away with, uh, with was the BATF by dropping the B and keeping the ATF. <laughs> well, that's slimming it down, right? Yeah, well, he certainly did, but not in terms of money or personnel, in brutality and intervention in our lives. But let's get to this uh, issue that you were talking about, the, uh, the fact that he brought down the Soviet Union. And that is, that is really disgusting because there's nothing but lies. Uh, as you may recall, uh, Gorbachev, like you said, uh, was going around actually telling uh, the uh, leaders of the different countries that they were going to have to hold these uh, power on their own. They could not count any longer on subsidies or tanks from the Soviet Union. He went, uh, uh, you may recall this, but he went to Havana in the mid-'80s. I think that was during Ronald Reagan's first term, and he threw a, a bucket of cold water on Castro by telling him that there was no more subsidies, nothing. He, you know, uh, Gorbachev loved them, but there wasn't going to be anything for him any longer. It got to the point uh, that things were getting – he gave uh, the, the independence to the Baltic states, even though the people over there are under the illusion that uh, they owe it to, to Ronald Reagan. Uh, yeah, actually, actually, if I may interrupt you, when that came about, George W. Bush, uh, not George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush, the current George Bush's father, uh, actually opposed that. He did not want the Baltic states. You're talking about Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. That's correct. He That's did correct. not want them to secede from the Soviet Union. Absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, and, and things were getting so much out of hand that a bunch of hardline communist generals decided to, uh, to have a coup against them. Uh, you may remember that. In fact, uh, very definitely, the news was that uh, that maybe he was, you know, he was dead, and, uh, and, and, and and this was the opportunity for common Russian people who were fed up. And I have to say, uh, they were led by Boris Yeltsin, even though he, you know, he was, <laughs> was a, uh, drunk. a pathetic drunk, you know, totally <laughs> corrupt, uh, you know, a despicable, you know, a human being. But he had his 15 minutes of fame on top of that tank. Absolutely, and I, I think that is what he was after more than anything else, because he he he, you know, he came up through the ranks. And we're not talking about the Libertarian Party ranks. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, in, in this, but what is made the most of is the challenge that he posed to Gorbachev. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down these walls, or some words to that effect. Yeah, tear down this wall. Right. Now, what would have happened if Mr. Gorbachev would have told Mr. Ronald Reagan, I will do so if you accept unconditionally every single Soviet citizen that wants to go to the United States. Do you think Ronald Reagan would have accepted that challenge? <laughs> no, not likely. So uh, it, it, it's just pure myth. Is this? Uh, it, 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 it's just made up by uh, Ronald Reagan and his henchmen uh, for their own particular benefit. Uh, they want to erect them as a god who uh, whose uh, policies are the ones that work and for which they should be elected because they're the ones who are telling them out. Right. So let me just say that your uh, analysis, after listen, listening, uh, you know, for a week uh, of solid flattery by the, the likes of Broca and other similar liars, uh, that your analysis is right on the money. And I hope you leave uh, this particular program uh, in the archives as long as possible. And I, I hope a lot of people can record it. Uh, because it's, it's going to make interesting history. Thank you. It will be in the archives, and also uh, by Monday morning there will be an article on my website to this effect. I'm in the middle of writing it now, uh, well, not this moment, but this weekend, and I hope that by Monday, pro probably Monday evening, it will be on my website. Thanks so much for calling, Mark. Always glad to hear from you. We're going to take a break, and we'll be right back. This is Harry Brown. Hello again. Harry Brown here. So glad to have you back and staying with me through the rest of this hour. Well, we have an email from Garrett in San Antonio saying, it's interesting to hear your take on Reagan. I was born in 1980, so I obviously don't know a lot about him, but I heard that when the Gun Owners Protection Act of 1986 was passed, some sh some, oh God, some shyster snuck. Uh, uh, Garrett in San Antonio, you can't have three words in a row beginning with S because I just can't handle that. Some shyster snuck in an amendment that banned all new civilian ownership of machine guns manufactured after May 1986. I heard that when Reagan found out about this particular amendment, he fired some of his close advisors for uh, omitting this from him. Do you know anything about this, and or do you think Reagan would do this? Why or why not? All right, I have never heard of the Gun Owners Protection Act of 1986, so I don't know what its thrust was supposed to be. Usually what happens is a bill is passed, and it has about a one-line description, the Safe Streets Act, which is to get drug dealers off the streets, or whatever it may be. And, of course, the bill itself may be completely different from what the title says. 
Gun Owners Protection Act sounds like it's something on behalf of gun owners, not taking away the right to keep and bear arms in some way. But since I don't know anything about the act, I have never heard about Reagan getting upset about this or anything else. I don't know anything about that. But I do know this. I do not believe a libertarian president would ever sign any bill without reading it from beginning to end himself. That's what the president is supposed to do. And if the bill is too long, that it would take hours for him to read it, then he shouldn't sign it. He should send it back to Congress and say, break this thing up into smaller bills so that I can read each bill and decide on its merits. But no president should leave in the hands of advisors who may have most of the president's agenda but may differ with him on some things. He should never leave in the hands of such people the responsibility of deciding whether or not he should sign a bill. And, of course, somebody who is determined to reduce government doesn't need long bills. He would just be signing short bills that say we are abolishing the Department of Energy or we are reducing the budget of the Department of Education to zero or we are taking the government completely out of health care. Henceforth, the government will impose no regulations, impose no subsidies and so forth with regard to health care in any form. And those bills might take all of one page, and I think a president would find the time to be able to read them. Let's go now to California and talk with Chuck. Good evening, Chuck. Hello, Henry Brown. Yes. Uh, let me just touch, just before I get on this abortion thing, let me just touch on Ronald Reagan a little bit. Ronald Reagan gave California um, checkoff for state income tax, you know. Yes, he, he instituted uh, withholding on right. income tax. While campaigning on the fact that taxes should hurt mm-hmm. and you should know what you're paying. Once he got into office, he went ahead and did the other. But I would like to, I'd like to deal with this part about abortion. That was very disturbing, that gentleman who, who wants to leave the party because, you know, because some people in the party believe that a woman should have the right to abortion. This has been a problem, I think, in the party all along. Yes, it's been a contentious issue. Right. And it occurred to me, and I've been trying to promote this concept, is that somebody should decide when life begins. And then from then on, government should protect that life. Even though you and I disagree with this, I believe that the function of government is to protect life, liberty, and property, and nothing else. And if, if it is determined that life begins... Oh, let's say when the heart starts beating, or when uh, when it can exist outside the womb by itself. If that's when life begins, then I believe that it's government's job to protect that life once life begins. Well, who's going to decide? I don't know. That's, uh... <laughs> well, let's see. We've got some choices here about who can decide this. We could have Bill Clinton decide. We could have Teddy Kennedy decide. We could have George Bush decide. What about Newt Gingrich? He ought to know. I always couch it in the terms of the wisest among us. Oh, yeah. Well, that's what, know you know, but, is, you're t- but you're really touching on a very important point here. That's the way we think of it, is that the wisest among us, the scientific community, whatever it might be. But in reality, this is something that's going to be hammered out at midnight, and a bunch of congressmen are going to vote on it, and they're going to vote exactly the way their party leaders tell them, without them ever seeing the bill itself, without ever reading what's in the bill, yeah. and it's going to wind up being one more political boondoggle. It just simply isn't going to happen. Government is not going to protect life and liberty, because government doesn't do anything well. As I've said before, if you look at the results of the war on drugs and the way it's escalated drug use, if you look at the way the war on poverty has expanded the welfare rules, then you know that a war on abortion is going to lead within 10 years to men having abortions. Uh, it just simply is not going to work, and we cannot count on government to do this. And every day that we spend trying to get the government to do something about abortion is a day wasted. It's a day that could have been spent trying to repeal the unreal realistic adoption laws that cause people to turn to abortion. It, it's a day wasted that could have been spent trying to repeal the income tax, which would have allowed more single earner families to exist so that somebody could be raising the children and teaching them values that would be less likely to lead to the abortion choice somewhere down the line. There are so many things that can be done that would actually do something to minimize abortion, but uh, turning to the government is no better than trying to turn to the government to make health care better. It just simply isn't going to work. Well, like you said about Ronald Reagan, that it, it did... Uh, foster that idea of, of government could be reduced. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm saying about this thing. It could foster the idea that the function of government is to protect life, liberty, and property, and yes. nothing else. Right. And it probably would do a better job at it if it quit doing all these other things, right. like chasing nonviolent drug users and prostitutes and, and things of that sort and filling the prisons with people who are no threat to anyone. It, and would, it would answer every question about every law that is presented. I mean, every law, you could take the law and you could drape it up against that yardstick. Does it protect life? Does it protect liberty? Does it protect property? If the answer to any of those questions is no, then it shouldn't be passed. Sure. But in the final analysis, political agencies are never going to give us what we want. And in the final analysis, it is we who will protect ourselves. It is we who will, and others like us, who will find ways of making it easier to protect ourselves once the government gets out of the way and quits draining our resources. I'm afraid we're going to be overrun by the masses long before that happens. Well, I understand your feeling. I hope you're wrong, but I understand your feeling that way. Chuck, thanks so much for your uh, insights on this. I appreciate it, and I hope to hear from you again. Let's go now to Massachusetts and talk with Matthew. Good evening, Matthew. 
Hello, Mr. Brent. How you doing? Just fine. Yourself? I'm doing good. Just, uh, you know, feeling a little upset about some uh, libertarians who don't want to seem to get to with the program uh, on things. And like the previous caller, not just one you were speaking with now, but Jeffrey from New Orleans, I believe his name was. Sure. And uh, <clears throat> just as an, this, this kind of attitude where there's this one issue, whether it be contentious or not, that suddenly they're just going to give up. Mm-hmm. And kind of give up the good fight because there's this one issue. It just kind of that kind of upsets me that people don't seem to want to. Uh, it's like these. I've seen other people like the whole thing where um, Russo wasn't elected, so a certain group of people were like, "Well, we're gonna we're gonna leave the Libertarian Party." You know, it's like, well, you weren't really with the program in the first place, obviously. Right. Or they're so, gonna try to run him as an independent candidate you know, or something. So, you know, some sure. of this other ridiculous garbage. And I also read this magazine once in a while called Liberty Magazine. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of it. Is this little like a, oh yes, I've heard of it. Yeah, and it's it, it's it's libertarian, but they're they're very negative towards the libertarian party, and um, it seems like they're they're wasting a lot of energy towards something that can, can you know towards a lot of people that are trying to do a lot of good things, right. trying to foster libertarianism in this country, and it seems like there's a certain group that kind of uh, looks. To, I don't know if they're looking down their noses or what's going on, but they think it's a worthless cause and. It kind of, it, you know, then you have this one thing where you have this certain group of people that's just like, oh, I don't like this one little thing, so I'm jumping, I'm jumping ship. Sure. And it, it really, it's, I mean, you're wasting your time and energy here. It's like you, you need to get with the program. We've got a lot of great people in this party, uh, who have yeah. a lot of great people in this country who are working night and day, spend, spending a lot of time and money, uh, and not a lot of money either. Sure, uh, and as a person of principle, you do not have to support programs that you don't agree with. Exactly. Whether you're talking about the ideology of it or the strategy of it, you don't have to support anything you don't want to support. But don't stick your leg out and trip people right. who are trying to move in the same direction that you are. Yeah, and, and you know, and, and Her- Mr. Brown, you know, I've, I've seen the platform. Actually, I was just looking at it last week, and the way it is stated is exactly that. that um, you know, that it's uh, not it is a sticky issue. That basically what it comes down to is the government shouldn't be involved in it. Period, um, and that. To me, that pretty much covers what needs to be covered. And, uh, you know, me and you have our own personal views on the, on the subject, but this is kind of like it's kind of getting bogged down in something that, you know, uh, you can look at it this way. Should the government be involved in it? No. Okay. Beyond that, what's, what, what's there to argue about? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm not sure what the, I mean, the the government shouldn't be involved in it in either way, whether supporting it or not supporting it. Right. As some, pe- some people have said, whatever the question is, liberty is the answer and government is never the answer. Yeah, it, you know, the government has its functions, which are very, which are very small, and that's that's all it needs to be. You know, there's it, it should be strictly by the constitution, and everything else should be something that our morals should be guiding us. And right. That's, you know, that's okay. what I have to say, and I also have to say a few other things. You need an extra hour, my friend. <laughs> this whole two-hour business just doesn't work. Uh, you need an extra hour because uh, you know we look forward to you every every weekend, and uh, and um, you know it's, it's. I'm not sure what happened where you were bumped up an hour. Uh, but um, you need an extra hour. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, I, I appreciate your call, too, Matthew. Yeah, take care, Ms. Brown. You bet. Bye-bye. And let's talk now with Garrett in San Antonio. Garrett? Hi, how you doing? Just fine. Thanks for your email. And yeah. Glad to call in, finally. Okay. Um, I don't want to go over too much ground already, but uh, abortion, that thing a while ago, same thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, where else are you going to go? <laughs> um, the president should read what he's got. Um, I was talking to my wife earlier about the thing in Iraq, you know, and... Uh, <clears throat> Should we have people over there? And she's all, well, we need to do something, you know, nice. And I would want someone to do something for me. And, you know, I can talk to her about, you know, would you want me over there possibly getting killed or her pickle rifle possibly getting killed? You know, the fact that there's nothing in the Constitution about it and, you know, trying to win that argument. And then the other thing is uh, just getting the message out. I don't know. I talked to Med Father's Day in the city close by here and had a good time and uh, got talking about Bush and Kerry. And my uh, family's pretty strong conservative and they don't want, you know, Kerry in there. And then I started talking about, you know, George Bush didn't, uh, Follow through with his promises about not doing any nation building and taxes, but they needed to steal taxes and the candidate for smaller government and all these things he said, but he's not doing. And, uh, you know, just trying to bring out some libertarian things here and there in a non aggressive way. And it seems like then a lot of other people just don't seem to get it. I mean, it's forced. Why, I mean, how can anybody morally justify, Christian or non Christian, anything, how can you morally justify forcing people to do something they want to do or telling them they can't do something they want to do as long as the person's not violating someone's rights? Or- right. And if, I think if you just gently, and I do mean gently, remind them of this each time another issue comes up, uh, it will have an effect over a period of time, and it will begin to have an inhibiting effect in the sense that people begin to get inhibited and when they suddenly jump at the idea, well, here, it's where we need a law, or we need to go in there and clean this country up, or whatever it is. Your general reminders four or five or six times over a period of a few months or whatever will begin 
begin to inhibit that reaction and suddenly people will realize just why are we forcing and it helps sometimes to personalize it when you're talking about a domestic thing you say well what family should we take the money from to pay for this what family should go without braces for their daughter's teeth or their son's education or or some other thing the new car that they've been saving up for what family should we take this money from and people begin to realize after a while that these abstractions called government programs really affect per- people personally they're not just to to make life better for one family they're going to make life worse for a lot of other families so don't be dismayed by this just go ahead and keep reminding them but do it gently remember everybody's really on our side in the final analysis everybody really wants to be able to make his own decisions and have the liberty the freedom to make those decisions it's just that a lot of people think the way to get there is by tearing up other people's lives along the way to do it and we just have to keep reminding them and we have to remember as i say that we are on the same side so don't treat them as adversaries treat them as friends that's all i can say garrett thanks so much for calling in a couple of quick emails Dan in San Diego says, if Jeffrey from New Orleans is leaving the party over the abortion plank, why was he ever a member? The platform has never changed. I suspect he was never a libertarian, so maybe we shouldn't be downhearted that he's leaving. Well, I don't know. Who decides when life begins, Dan asks. Each state decides for itself. There is no single answer. Jeff in Prescott, Arizona says, not to defend politicians as a group, but I did have one very good experience with Ronald Reagan. He goes on to uh, recount uh, having actually met Reagan and that Reagan impressed him as genuinely interested in what Jeff had to say and that even Jeff's dog liked him. And he says, nobody's perfect, but Reagan was better than some, yet not ideal, but I prefer him rather than what I've seen since, but I'd rather do without. But my point, of course, was that we don't elect people just because they're genuinely tuned to what we have to say. We're trying to elect people who will do something to make government smaller. Well, let's take a final phone call tonight from Scott in Massachusetts. Good evening, Scott. Sorry to leave you to the last minute. Oh, can you hear me? Sure. Top of the uh, morning to you. Thank you. Um, I uh, had a question uh, about people that you recommend reading nowadays in the, in the larger media. Um, I read your books in the 70s, and I had the good fortune of going back to what I would call the greatest generation of libertarian writers that influenced you, people like Ludwig von Mises and Henry Hazlitt. And one of the things you noticed in the earlier decades was that they had somewhat of a presence in the larger mainstream media. You know, for 20 years, Hazlitt had a column in Newsweek, which was regularly reprinted in Reader's Digest, etc. Isabel Patterson was in the New York newspapers in the 30s and 40s. And um, nowadays, it seems like you don't have any of those old right type voices or people who patiently explain the principles of free market economics in the larger newspapers and news magazines the way you did, say, with Hazlitt for about 20 years. I think I know one very possible reason for that, and that is that at the time those people were writing, the Republican Party spoke much, much more about small government than they do now, and they had people in the party like Robert Taft and others who really did carry out what they said. It wasn't just all talk and no action. And so the views of people like Henry Hazlitt and Isabel Patterson and Rose Wilder Lane and some of those were more respectable at that time than they are today when what you have are the two main parties both hell-bent on making government as big as possible. And so uh, somebody like Hazlitt might not have a column in Newsweek today as he did for so many years back in the 40s. So where do you go today to find the, their heirs? And- On the Internet, thank- yeah. thankfully. And I, I am so happy that we have the Internet because there is so much information that we get, so much exposure, and immediate exposure, not just a week later when it arrives in the mail or when you hear about it from somebody else, but you can get it the day that it's published. You get it right there on the Internet. And it's not just opinions, but it's also facts that we might not ever, ever hear in the absence of the Internet. And it's it's such a wonderful medium, and it augurs very, very well for the future of liberty in America, I think. When is your next book coming out of the war racket? <laughs> oh, gosh. I'm not really sure. It is really taking me a long time. It's a it's a job much, much larger than I thought when I bit it off to begin with. It's, it's really uh, seems sometimes more than I can chew, but I'm going to finish it, and I am going to publish it, and it's going to be there sometime, I hope, sometime next year, but I can't promise it. Amazon has it listed as of April 15th that, that, was out, that it was out on tax day. Right, and two or three day delivery. Uh, good luck to them. I mean, that, that's, uh, people are like, you know, your fans are chomping at the bit now. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. And I'm sorry that I can't speak to all those people and let them know that you're not going to get it from Amazon in two or three days. I don't know what happens if you click on Buy It Now from Amazon. I don't know what they finally tell you. You probably get an email a day or two later saying that it isn't available after all. But I will do the best I can. In the meantime, Liberty A to Z is out. And right. if you go to my radio links page, just go to harrybrown.org and click on the links to articles and websites mentioned on the broadcast, you'll see a link to Liberty A to Z, which is being sold by Advocates for Self-Government. And I'm really glad that that's available now. Uh, one other quick, quick plug before you go. Uh, tell your I'll tell your listeners to go to the Amazon page for your fail-safe investing, and they can read the long, re- long and glowing review I gave of it. Oh, I remember that, Scott. Thanks so much. we got to go. Tune in again next week. I look forward to talking with you then. This is Harry Brown. Have a very good week, and don't let all this get you down.